All right, great. This will be in some sense independent of the first lecture in that we're just going to state and prove a theorem. Uh, so it's self-contained, but uh, as you'll see, there'll be some tricks that will seem more familiar because you've had practice with some of these things. Uh, so the theorem is as follows. Uh, uh, you take M, any closed manifold, and G, any separable topological group. Separable means that there exists a countable dense set in G as a topological space. All right. Uh, and then any abstract homomorphism from the identity component of the group of homeomorphisms of M to G is. Well, I didn't assume it was continuous, but conclusion, it is continuous. Uh, so this theorem was proved by Rosenthal and Selesky for one-dimensional manifolds, uh, and then Rosenthal for two-dimensional manifolds, and then sort of subsuming the argument into for that, that version into a general case, I did this for the arbitrarily, arbitrary manifolds all at once. And... Uh, uh, we're just gonna we're just gonna do the proof with some commentary along the way about like what little tools we're using and like what other situations these things might apply for. If you're applied to, if you're somehow like some previous expert on some of these sub tools or whatever, you might want to think about some questions as we go along. Like, how am I using a group of homeomorphisms instead of I don't know diffeomorphisms, piecewise linear homeomorphisms? Like, choose your favorite other group, you know, what if instead of a manifold, I was a Cantor set, these kind of things you might want to, you know, to keep yourself entertained, you can run in your head. If you're seeing this for the first time, don't do that. All right. All right. All right. So, proof. Uh, uh, so, I'm given some abstract homomorphism phi. And since it's a homomorphism, a general group theory thing, I only have to prove continuity in a neighborhood of the identity. So suffice to prove continuous at identity in, oh, I don't know, in homeo or whatever. Namely, let's write down very pedantically what that means, i.e. for any neighborhood, uh, I don't know, U of identity in G, there exists a neighborhood V of identity in homeo such that phi of V goes into U, okay? Or equivalently, right, V is a subset of the pre-image of U. All right, and just like in, uh, you know, when you learn epsilon delta, it proves for the same time, right? What what's what's going to happen somewhere along the line is actually like, oh, oops, I proved that like, you know, I, well, it would have worked if I had chosen three epsilon instead of epsilon. Uh, we could also prove something like that, uh, you know, for all neighborhood U, there exists some K such that uh, where K is not a V and K don't depend on each other, right? But this thing actually ended up in U to the K uh, instead. U to the K means this is in my group. This is all words of length K in elements in U, right? That you think of U as being like an epsilon ball. This is the K time epsilon ball. Uh, all of these groups are metrizable. So you can put some left invariant metric on them as you like. Sorry, why is it metrizable? Ah, so the burkhoff kakutani metrization theorem tells you that at, that for a topological group being first countable and being metrizable and having a left invariant metric that generates the topology are all equivalent. Why are we so uh, I have a countable dense set, and so I should also have a countable basis for my topology just by translating a ball around by like a, a neighborhood basis of a point. Um, 
So that's fine. Uh, replace G in, in the intended applications, G will always be some nice group that happens to be metrizable. So you should think of these. I mean, yeah, you, you can prove this more generally without a metric, but psychologically pretend you have a metric on your group. Okay, uh, just in case also I got my topology facts wrong and my uh, unpracticed aside, it's, it's happened before. Okay, um, good, that K there is just there is a, is a warning. Uh, so my first uh, lemma towards this, uh, so that's just like actually what we have to prove, that's not a proof yet, but let's do as a lemma, which we'll prove now and then we'll put it in our back pockets until the very end. Uh, it's going to be some kind of bare category trick, okay? And it's going to say that actually something like this is, is is almost true. You're like very close to being continuous in some kind of uh, some kind of sense. Uh, and it says that uh, you know for all such neighborhood U of identity in G, uh, there exists some B, you know, neighborhood of identity and homeo such that uh what did i want i wanted v to be contained in the pre-image of u and what i'll actually get is that v is contained in the pre-image of u. well not that but it's closure so i'm not really contained in uh where i want to be but i'm dense in it uh uh great okay so let's prove this um so i'm going to uh oh and and some here here i might end up with a fact of two but no let me be careful with my k's for once and i'll i'll do this one properly and then we'll like punch later okay so uh, i'm going to make one assumption to make this proof go a little quicker i have to save some time somewhere so i'm going to assume just as a simplifying assumption to save me five minutes of the same line of arguments, that this map is surjective. Okay, otherwise do a half board of stuff that you can do as an exercise if you want. Um, so that's just my cheat. You don't really need it. Uh, and let's see, let's, uh, this shrink by a factor I'll do carefully now. So let me say that let u prime inside of u be a smaller neighborhood that's symmetric. So in any neighborhood of the identity assertion, I can find another one, symmetric meaning if, if you know some g and g is in here, so is g inverse. Okay. And actually I'm going to make it even smaller in such that uh U prime, U prime is a subset of U. As I was writing it before, U prime squared. Right, so just shrink to a symmetric ball of half the radius if you're thinking in terms of a metric thing. Uh, good. And let's see, let W be the pre-image of this U prime, this smaller thing. That'll give me a little bit of wiggle room when I get V slightly wrong. I'll actually have a little more room to work with. Okay, so what do I have? I have basically nothing. I know that G is that that G is separable. So uh, let's take a countable dense subset. Let I don't know G I be countable dense set in G have to use that somewhere. Uh, uh, and so then what do I know? G is equal to, uh, if I take uh, my G I and I translate my little open set uh, V uh, by G I and I take the union of all of these, um, I'll cover G, right? Because this is some dead set, that's an open set. I took a look at all of its left translates. So I have an open set about a dense set of points. Okay, um, so let me apply the pre-image under phi, my map to this equation. So I assumed I was surjective. This now says that homeo. Oops, who's, I may have, yes, yeah, sorry. This is you prime, thanks. I forgot which one lived where. Uh, yes, good. 
Okay, so now let me let me apply phi inverse to both sides of this equation. Homeo of my manifold group uh, is now equal to a countable union of just pick someone in the pre-image. Uh, and uh, do this W. So maybe I don't need to say full pre-image. I can just say, yo. Oh, yeah, yeah, no, I should do this. I should do this. Sorry, I should just do this right in homeo. My bad. No, 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 no. I, 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 I should read my notes because then I'll do it correctly. Great. We can go directly here. Uh, okay, so I'm surjective, so I hit all of these. Yeah, do keep me honest. Uh, so let, I don't know, HI in homeo be such that phi HI equals GI. Okay. Um, can we back up a bit and yes. say why we can assume phi is surjective? Uh, you can't. I want to save okay. five minutes of my life because <laughs> otherwise I'll never get to the end. Okay. So we're going to cheat. <laughs> yes. I mean, uh, again, you do a 10 minute argument of general things about reasonably reasonable topological groups. If you pretend everything has a metric on it and you're using epsilon balls, you should just, you can do it by hand, just do it. Yeah, which is why I want you to pretend everything's met, metrized. Okay, so now what do I want to assert is that my claim is that homeo is equal to the union of phi hi translates of this w. Uh, sorry, of HI. And now I think that this should be fine because I have a... Uh... Wait, Sebastian, you had me worried. I think your objection is not an objection. I had a neighborhood of the identity in my group that was open and I had a countable dense subset and I looked at the translates of this. Then I will cover my whole group. Yeah. And and then I take pre-images and I arrive at this line. And it's, we're fine. It's, it's a group fact, not it a is a group fact. It is not a space fact. Yeah. I use the neighborhood of the identity. Yes. Good. Okay. So I'm sorry. Great. So I to justify this line, I should write that G is a union of G I of uh, this U prime. Yes. And therefore taking pre-images of everything we arrive here. Okay, great. Uh, the group of homeomorphisms of a manifold, I will not prove. This happens to be a bare space in the bare category theorem sense. You're supposed to believe that it's a huge but not unmanageable group. All right. So uh, these are not nowhere dense sets. Uh, and since they're all left translates of one set W, uh, this W is not nowhere dense, uh, meaning it's somewhere dense, meaning that W closure contains some open set, I don't know, V prime or something like this. And what was W? It was the pre-image of a symmetric set under uh, under a homomorphism. So it's symmetric, all right? And so my claim is that W closure times all the inverses of elements in W closure, but you're symmetric, so that actually is the same thing as W itself, uh, contains uh, some open neighborhood of the identity. I have some open set, you need to do a little argument here. This part's pretty, this part has a lot of fill in the details, but if I am then allowed to translate back by inverses of elements, I will land at some open neighborhood of the identity. Okay, so let's call that V, right? And well, what? wait, what is this by definition? This is phi inverse of U prime, U prime closure, okay, which is, and the, which is exactly what we want to show that's going to be contained in the closure of phi inverse of u. 
<laughs> All right, so anyway, a little illustration of what you can do just with the bare category theorem and some like group facts. And put that in your back pocket because we're going to need it later. Uh, this, as long as I, you know, I'm allowed to kind of approximate things. That's what pick closure means uh, uh, by, by, by elements of the, of the identity. Okay. There, there is my lemma. Okay, but it's, it's sort of amazing what you can get for free. All right. Okay, so the next step. All right. So uh, it's the same kind of setup. Um, this time I'm not going to immediately pass to a U prime U prime or something, or like a product of something contained in here. We'll just, you know, accidentally at the end realize that I have some like power, some, some, something I should have passed to at the beginning and we'll fix that at the end. Okay. So we're going to go with the same setup. Suppose I have, uh, you know, W equals the pre-image of some neighborhood of the identity. And I really want to find some little V open neighborhood of the identity and homeo that sits inside of here. Right. Uh, and again, the, the same kind of argument we did before. It's symmetric. And uh, as we had before, I can think of my group of homeomorphisms as a union of uh, left translates, let's say HI of this W, countably many translates. And remember, my goal is to show that this contains a little neighborhood of the identity. All right, so my, my claim is that while I'm not good enough to show it contains a whole neighborhood of the identity, I'm gonna show it contains a lot of homeomorphisms. I claim that actually there exists a little ball. I don't know, let's say A in your in your manifold. And, oh no, I want to I don't want to be able to localize. Hmm. All right. You give me any target ball, little A in your manifold for any ball. There exists a sub ball. All right. Maybe this here, the inside of A, so that uh, any homeomorphism with uh, support contained in B uh, is inside. So I don't have a whole neighborhood of the identity, but everywhere in my manifold, I can find tiny little balls so that everything who's supported on that ball gets uh, uh, gets into here. You're, this should make you optimistic, right? Fragmentation says like a neighborhood of the identity is just a product of things supported on little balls. So this is our first step towards showing like actually a, a whole neighborhood of the identity gets sent into here. All right, does this seem like a reasonable First claim to prove this, remember what we want, want is that W contains neighborhood of the identity. And what we really want is like, you know, by, by grade school epsilon delta, we really want actually some like K that doesn't depend on your manifold or your choices at all so that like W to the kth power contains some neighborhood of the identity. Okay. And, uh, and my claim is that I can't get this right away, but I'll do the first step. Instead of a neighborhood of the identity, I'll get everything supported on a tiny ball. Uh, and I won't get W right away. I'm going to get W to the eight. It's a word of maybe eight things in W at most. OK, so that's what we want to prove. I pause because. We're gonna prove not quite this right away. I'm gonna actually prove a subplain. This is what we're headed for. Subplain uh, for all balls A. Uh, there exists some ball in A so that I won't get it quite what we want, uh, but I'll get that any F with its support in my ball B um, 
I would like it to be in W to the eight. Instead, I'm gonna get um, it agrees with something in W to the two or four or something like this. All right, so so write this precisely. There exists some G in W two such that the restriction of G to this little ball is equal to F restricted to this little ball. This is gonna help us with our claim because you were just a master of commutator tricks where like if things were living on balls, you could get them to kind of do what you wanted by like moving them off. We're gonna go from subclaim to claim with a trick that you just kind of practiced. All right. Okay, but actually the subclaim is slightly too hard. So we're gonna prove a sub subclaim. All right which is the following. I will make reference to my, uh, my union of translates of W that makes up the homeomorphism group. All right. And I'm going to actually say that for any ball A, let's pick countably many small balls inside A, B1, B2, all disjoint balls in A. Oh, B1, B2, B3, B4, countably many. And my claim is, my sub-sub claim is that there exists one of these balls, exists I, so that uh, for any F that's supported on ball number I, there exists some G in my H I W translate. This I is the same as that I, okay? Uh, such that the restriction of G to B I equals the restriction of F to. And moreover, in both of these subclaims, I can take uh, G to be supported. Now I have broken this up into enough sub 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 steps that we can just knock them all out really easily. Okay, trick number one, let's prove this sub sub claim. These seem like super tricky, but it's because they've been refined over time. The automatic continuity was originally of interest in descriptive set theory and the same kind of toolkit applies. And it's been distilled to kind of to its essence. And this is how the argument almost always goes. So um, sub sub claim, what should I do? Okay, so uh, I take my disjoint balls, all right? Setup is in the picture, I pick them. And what I want to show is this assertion is true. So suppose for contradiction, it is not. Suppose, uh, not. Well, uh, then I can find a sequence of counterexamples, one F for each BI that does not satisfy this conclusion. And for all I, there exists some, I don't know, FI supported on BI so that there does not exist G uh, supported on A. In uh, that doesn't and it, what is G is supposed to be in H I W, uh, and where G restricted to B I equals F I restricted to B I, just wrote the negation. So in my picture, I'm gonna just do them all at once. F one lives here. F two lives here. F three lives here. Let big F be the product of all of these little F I's. It's supported on my original set A, right? It just lives there I, by construction, right? It's supported on the union of the deep eyes. It's, an, it's a homeomorphism of my manifold. It's a composition of, well, it's an infinite composition, but this converges to homeomorphism. I can tell you what it does to every point. Identity here, identity here, does whatever F3 was doing here. Uh, so it's a homeomorphism, so it's in some translate. Oops, I already used the letter I. Uh, this is in some HJW for some J. Uh, oops. If I look at BJ, it exactly agrees with FJ. That's how I cooked it up. But 
f restricted to bj equals little fj. So it is exactly playing the role of the G that I claim did not exist. Contradiction. Wow, that was somehow too easy or something. Yes, questions? Oh, A is just my target here. So I claim it's nothing special about some corner of the manifold that you've picked out. It's like anyone gives you a local chart, you can do this whole thing within a chart. A is just a subset of the manifold. Oh yeah, let's say A inside of M. Yeah, so so what was confusing is over there, I didn't use the fact that we were a homeomorphism group of anything or there was an ambient manifold or whatever. I was just doing general group theory tricks. Here, suddenly we're going to interact with the space. Other questions? Yeah. I'm having trouble parsing the negation of the side. For all G supported on A in inside W, G should disagree with. Ah, uh, yeah, maybe I wrote too fast and I got something wrong. So my claim is that, uh, wait, yes, what did I get? So I wanted to say that for everyone supported on here, there exists something that agrees with it. So if that's not true, then for, then there exists an app for each, so that for all, yes. What's, where does oh, I wrote does not exist equals, equals, but now it's for all they don't equal. Great, that's their logically equivalent, yeah. Where does the support come from? Uh, this part. Oh, <laughs> my horrible board. Work. That's where it comes from. You can ignore the supported on A part for a moment. Uh, yeah. You could have proved this like in the forward direction by just saying suppose that like these can see like the same supported on I, and then voila, this product does the thing that I want. Um. No, because what I want to say is that uh, one of these balls has the property that everything on it is in the same translate H of W. And that's a lot to, I don't see a way to do that directly, okay. right? So it's not, I'm proving an assertion. There's a mystery ball I have not identified, but on here, literally everything supported on there is in the same one of these translates of W. Okay, great. Sub-sub uh, implies subclaim very quickly. Okay, and my subclaim, the B, is going to be the same uh, BI I found here. All right, so I'm given my magic ball BI from the sub-subclaim. All right. And then someone gives me an F supported there. F supported on BI. Okay. Well, the sub sub claim tells me that F, oh, that there exists uh, some G depending on F in HIW that agrees with F on this ball. Just restated the sequence. So I can, since it's in this translate of W, I can write this as, I don't know, HI times some little element W that depends on F. Well, for trivial reasons, the identity map is also supported on BI. It fixes the complement. So the identity map running the same argument is equal to HI times some W uh, I guess sub id, some element of W that, uh, um, uh, where that happens to agree with the identity of the I. Same logic. Okay, so now what should I do? I'm gonna write F is equal to uh, F times the inverse of the identity map. Identity inverse times F. What, that's a trivia, that's, that's a silly way to write it, right? But now I can say that, what does this mean? Uh, this means that agreeing with F on BI is uh, the thing that agrees with F on BI, H, I, W sub F. And then the thing that agrees with the inverse of the identity of, on BI, which is H, I inverse, W sub id, inverse. Great, and these cancel. And now I've written uh, F 
restricted to bi equals to the product of two elements in w restricted to bi. This is proof is all tricks, but you gotta parse them one by one. Okay, so we're gonna work our way back up. We we proved the subclaim. Wait, we proved the sub subclaim. We proved the subclaim using it, and now we're gonna prove the claim using this one. Okay. So far, so good. All right. Okay. So someone gave you a uh, open set A in your manifold, and by the subclaim. We found this ball, bi, so that everything for anything that lives here, there exists something that lives in A, A and agrees with this, right? So let me write it down. F by sub name, sub F in bi implies that there exists some element, I don't know, uh 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 whatever uh f1 in w squared f1 restricts to bi equals f restricted bi okay well now i'm going to use do the subclaim again uh oh oh and here's the part where it's key that f1 that's what we just did I'm going to use do the, do the subclaim again, pretending bi is now playing the role of a, and I'm going to find some little cj inside of here, a little ball. And the subclaim now applied to this nested, this, this, the ball bi instead says that similarly there exists a cj, so that if the support of a homeomorphism is in my cj, then uh, there exists some, I don't know, uh, F in W squared. Uh, it restricts to uh, CJ to agree with my original F and its support is in the ball B. You can forget your indices. There's no more things to count anymore. Uh, good. This CJ is going to be the claimed B from my for, that I claim that I asserted exists. Yeah, we're gonna put C the CJ. Okay. Okay. And I claim that if you live there, you're actually inside W of the H. All right. Okay. Well, here's one thing we know that uh, if I'm given F where the support of F is inside of this CJ, I can write F as a single commutator of things that also are supported here. Ah, uh, that's that's a lot. That's a trick we did yesterday. We we put a bunch of parallel balls. Okay. Uh, good. So now I'm going to plug A into this equation and find something that I'll call, I don't know, A2, and uh, it satisfies, oops, that's F. Uh, no, this is A. On C, the littlest one. Yeah, CJ. Well, the CJ, the smallest ball, which is gonna play the role of B in my proof. This is where A and B live. Okay, so it, 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 I, 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 Recall that A just is supported on here and I plug it in here. And I'm going to plug B into my previous one. B is supported on this very tiny ball, but it's inside this bigger ball. So I can pretend that it's supported here. It just happens to be the identity on a large subset. So now I will say that B lives here. So there's some, I don't know, B1 that restricts on this big ball to agree with B and happens to be supported on A. Good. So uh, my claim is that uh, the commutator of A and B, that's F, is the same as the commutator of the, these weird substitutions. What did I call them? A2 and B1. And if my claim is true, I've won. 
This is A2 is a uh, in is a product of two things in W. This is a product of two things in W. Their inverses are also products of two things in W. I stack up all these four things for my commutator, and I get something that's a product of of uh, eight things in W. So I would win. Okay, so I just have to prove my claim, and what do we do? We check like we were doing in recitation a lot. Uh, why do these two things agree? Well, on uh, the smallest possible set, CJ, I cooked it up so that both A2 and B1 restrict to A and B here. So they're here the commutator agrees. If I go somewhere else, I claim at least one of them as the identity anywhere else. Like for instance, if I'm inside my ball B1, this is why I cooked it up this way, uh, B, B I or whatever this ball was called, B1 agrees with B on this ball, this big one. So it happens to be the identity outside the pick set because B was the identity outside the pick set. I have no control over what A is doing there, but who cares? Uh, it, it'll cancel in its commutator. Similarly out here, I don't know uh, what uh, the other one is doing, what B is doing. But A is the identity because I cooked it up to be, is A2 is the identity because I cooked it up to be supported on B1. Right. That's why all of this annoying bookkeeping is going on. So the proof is we just checked, or you can double check. The idea being that except on the, except on the smallest ball, CJ, at least one of these was always the identity. That proves my claim. Uh, and oh, we're almost out of time. Okay, but we're almost done. So let's finish the proof given the claim, or at least I'll wave my hand towards the end of the proof. And uh, and then you're well set up. All right. So we don't need this anything else anymore. We just need the claim to be proved. All right. So let's naively finish attempts to uh, finish. So attempt to finish. And our attempt will fail, but it'll be very close to success. And I'll tell you what you need to do to succeed. So I'm going to cover uh, my manifold M by tiny balls. Uh, tiny enough, uh, let's say I take a finite cover, A1, A2, AM, finitely many. And, and where here tiny is going to come from the neighborhood of the identity of the bare category lemma. So I want the size given by bare category lemma. And what the consequence of the bare category lemma, it says if I have a small enough set and someone gives me for any little open set, uh, bi subset ai, there exists uh, someone in bare category trick. Um, what was that one called? V. There exists some uh, homeomorphism in V such that T of uh, ai goes into bi. So uh, what did I just say here? I have some ball, it's diameter. These are my cover of balls, a1. A2. I assert that if this if this di if this ball has diameter uh, epsilon, then something epsilon close to the identity can take it basically to a point. Right. So if you give me an open set and you give me a little wiggle room, I can use something epsilon close to the identity to take this ball into this set. Right. So that's what T is supposed to do. Uh, my claim said that. Uh, there exist some balls, those were the Bs, uh, in each of my balls A, so that anything supported on Bi uh, was in W to the H. And then, therefore, anything supported on uh, AI, well, if I conjugate it by this 
shrinking map T, uh, it'll be supported on VI, so it'll be uh, in W to the A. So anything, any map F supported on AI has T F T I, I guess, F T I inverse supported on B, so in W to the eight. Uh, so V was playing the role of W there before. I guess I should have. Uh, v here is the neighborhood of the identity. Uh, so I'm allowed a little fudge room. Um, so I guess this guy says that F is in what? V, W to the eight, V. Okay. And fragmentation says that uh, the, that if I take products of the M things, one supported on each ball, I cover a whole neighborhood. That was strong fragmentation from last time. So we can finish by saying fragmentation, or one version of it I stated last time, says that uh, the set of all homeomorphisms F, such that F equals, I don't know, A1, A2, An, M, where the support of AI is in my set, my ball AI. This contains a neighborhood, or it is a neighborhood as the identity if you like. And what did I just show? I showed anything like this. Well, each individual one is in like this little guy. I can allow V to be absorbed by W. That's in what W eight, nine, 10 or something like this. Uh, so this is in W to the, the 10 times F, which is what we were ho have, hoping to show. And that's how the proof ends, except that I did one thing that you're not allowed to do, which was, there's enough details here that I bet no one caught it, but somewhere in here, I let like epsilon depend on delta, which is bad, okay? Uh, the, the size of my balls sort of was given by the bare category lemma and the size that I got as output really was depending on the U that I got as input. So you have to solve this problem by not working with balls. It wasn't actually important that I worked with balls, but just that, that disjoint sets. And if you have a reasonable, if you have a manifold, there's a, you can make a nice cover of it by disjoint sets where the number of things in your cover only depends on the dimension of the manifold. So if you're a little slicker and where I'm happy to detail for you later, um, then, uh, then uh, you can take these to be, instead of balls, you could take them to be unions of disjoint balls and run a kind of a parallel or argument of this and you win. And you no longer have epsilon depending on delta and you're fine. And that's how you prove automatic continuity. I think uh, I think that's probably enough for today. Thanks. Yeah. So right. I I want M to I I if I want to actually make this robust, right? This number M for for this thing to be a real proof, M should only depend on your manifold. Right. Okay. But the what I did in this part at the end, my naive attempt to finish was. The size of these was supposed to be given by my bare category lemma. And it, as input there, I didn't give you just the manifold. I gave you the neighborhood of the identity you were supposed to target, right? That's epsilon or something like this. And, uh, and so, so this is no good. Okay, but I can solve the problem by actually lumping these together is maybe the easiest way to think about it. If A1 and A5 happen to be disjoint, like call the union of the both of these, big A or something like this and, and treat them as one and it works out. And that's some, the combinatorics of a cover is something that only depends on the dimension of your manifold.